Hey, welcome everybody back for our next Bible study session of uh, studying the book, How the Bible Actually Works by Dr. Peter Enns and reading right beside that passages from our Bibles. Uh, I'm John Fairless, the pastor of Venice United Church of Christ. Most of you watching know that, but you know, if we happen to have somebody new today, welcome. We are in chapter five of our textbook, and there will be several um, uh, scripture references along the way, and so we'll be turning to those. I will say that the opening illustration and the scripture for today evoke a very somber tone as uh, Dr. Enns talks about the pain of losing a child. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 15 is our opening scripture which says, Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. We know that trauma of that level is more than life-changing. Experiencing the loss of a child, and quite honestly, the loss of anyone that we love, but I guess particularly in this instance, um, this becomes a point of reference for an entire lifetime and beyond. Many, many people may be affected by an event like that. And he goes on to state, that the exile of the Jewish people from their homeland, first to Assyria and then to Babylon, was just such a national trauma for God's people, occurring about 600 years before the time of Christ. Uh, on pages 98 and 99, Dr. Enns writes this, the Israelites believed that they owed their existence to God's irrevocable promise, irrevocable promise to, to Abraham of countless descendants and a perpetual kingdom of their own in a land of their own. That promise had been confirmed to them through a series of stories that they told, beginning with God's call to Abraham, the miraculous birth of Abraham's son Isaac, Israel's later deliverance from slavery in Egypt under Moses, receiving the law and the Ten Commandments on Mount Sinai, the successive conquest by Joshua as they moved into the promised land, and eventually the founding of the monarchy with God's chosen king, David, on the throne. So you may or may not be familiar with that series of stories. A lot of us that have had the opportunity to study Genesis last year see a lot of this, and you may have read these over time. They kind of go together into this narrative, into this story, which roughly forms the first half of what we call the Old Testament, the Hebrew Scriptures. Now, in these stories, the nation and the God's people, Israel, were not perfect. And the Bible's very honest about that. But what you see is that God stuck with them. Later in their history, the nation divided, and it was the, the northern half of the kingdom that was conquered first by Assyria. And then around 200 years later, the southern kingdom, known as Judah, was gone too. Jerusalem was destroyed, and the temple was burned to the ground. To get just a glimpse of how serious this was for the Israelites, just remember uh, September the 11th, 2001, and multiply that by, honestly, probably 100 times or so. How would we have felt if that horrible devastation had been throughout our entire country? It was awful. And so Dr. Enns points out uh, several questions that Israel was asking as they processed this terrible tragedy. How could God let this happen? How could God abandon us? 
How could God turn his back on the promise that he made all the way back to Abraham? And what is it that's going to happen to us now? Are we no longer God's chosen people? <laughs> Seventy years later, after that final round of conquering, the people did begin to go back to their promised land. And we've got a couple of books in the story, the book of Nehemiah, the book of Ezra, that tell the story of uh, the people going back and beginning to rebuild, and they started building uh, the temple again. You will sometimes hear, uh, particularly uh, Bible historians, talk about the second temple or second temple Judaism. Well, this is what happened. They began to build the temple back. But they were still under the rule of a foreign leader, this time the king of Persia. That's today's Iran, Iraq, that area. The Persians let them go back, but they still had to answer and pay taxes to the king. And so their questions began to shift a little bit. Now, Israel begins to ask, how much longer before we can have our own king again? And when will things finally get back to normal? And what are we supposed to do in the meantime? Most of what we now know as that latter half of the Hebrew scripture, the, the sort of uh, back, back of the book, uh, uh, in the Old Testament, these writings came to be written down during and after the period of the exile. On page 102, we read this. The exile forced them, the nation of Israel, to engage their past and reimagine God for their present and future. This is how the Bible was born, out of crisis. And the question that drove these ancient writers was the wisdom question that we've been looking at all along. What is God up to today, right here and now? You find that on page 102. Now, what is quite striking to me is how this shift in mindset, this reframing, of the God story of Israel's faith gave rise to the expectation and the hope for a Messiah, which sets the stage for the church's story of Jesus. That's, that's where we live. That's the story we tell, right? But those questions, how much longer till we get our own king again? They began to uh, look for a new king to come. When will things finally get back to normal? When will Israel be made a, a great nation again? It was an expectation of the Jewish Messiah. And what are we supposed to do in the meantime? They began to talk about this idea, and they began to look for the coming of one who would save them. Well, uh, Dr. Ian, returning to his thought, that's my idea. I'm just, I'm just really struck by that. You can almost see it happening as we're reading the, these Bible passages. You can see the shift going on, the way their minds are changing. And so Dr. Enns then spends some time contrasting the stories found in the book of Jonah, which he notes, we always try to turn into a, a children's story, but it's not really that much of a children's story if you read the whole thing. And then the book of Nahum, which occurs right next to Jonah in the order of the Bible as we have it. He shows how the same event could be interpreted and told differently at two different times and from differing perspectives. Both of those stories are about how God deals with with Nineveh, which was a foreign nation, which was part of the oppressor. It's in Assyria. It's part of that land that conquered the Jewish people. Uh, in fact, the city of Nineveh in the Bible is 
uh, pretty much the same location of, a lo of something we heard of, especially the last you know five or ten years or so. It's the city of Mosul in, I think that's Iraq. I think, yeah, Mosul in Iraq. And it was for a time the headquarters of ISIS, the terrorist organization that uh, was threatening people all over the world. Now, again, that kind of gives you the setting. Nineveh was kind of the same way back in those days. And yet the story of Nahum, which was written first, Nahum was a prophet, is a proclamation of how God is going to punish the city of Nineveh and that land for the way they've been treating God's people. Jonah comes later and tells the story of a prophet that God called to go to Nineveh to preach repentance, and they did. The people of Nineveh repented, and God blessed them. Now, again, why two different versions or two different takes on this story? Well, on uh, pages 102 to 106, Dr. Enns offers a very helpful perspective on the same thing that happens in the narratives of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, which are considered the history books in this Hebrew scriptural library that we have. Remember, not one book, multiple books. And so they, uh, these books originally written as one eventually were broken into two sections each, first and second Samuel, first and second Kings, and then first and second Chronicles. Why do we have, like Jonah and Nahum, the same event told in two different ways? Why do we have in uh, key events like the reign of the evil king Manasseh, which is the main one he quotes, appear to happen differently in those early books of Samuel and Kings than they do in the later book that was written, Chronicles. You can read those and, and you realize that these two books are talking about many of the same events, but things are shifted. Things happen a little differently. Well, precisely because for Dr. Enns, the books of Chronicles are nothing less than one big act of reimagining God. That's a quote. In Kings, Manasseh is portrayed as purely evil, and the nation is destroyed because of him. This is why God allowed those conquerors to come in, because Manasseh led the people away from God and let idol worship come in and lots of other things. In Chronicles, Manasseh starts out the same way, but then he is the one carried away into exile. And while he's away, he repents. And he is then returned to his kingship by God and he finishes as a good king. His grandson, a king by the name of Josiah, is actually going to lead a great revival in Israel. And um, so it's, it's, it's got a different tune. This is a symbolic retelling of Judah's exile and their return home after the captives had learned their lesson and repented of their sins. This is the background, this Chronicles retelling, shifting of the story, is the background of an often quoted verse. Um, I hear it a lot, especially in evangelical and the term that's arisen lately, Christian nationalist circles. Um, I don't want to say anything more about that at this moment, but here's the verse. You may be familiar with it from 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves, pray, seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. It's a good sounding verse to just kind of pick up and put it on a plaque or 
a bumper sticker or a poster or something, but it is connected. The deeper connection is to the story of Manasseh, that king, that penitent sinner who was restored to the place of God's favor. And the story was reimagined and was retold as a reminder to the audience, this nation uh, that is trying to come back from these uh, terrible events of their lives, that God will fully heal them too if they will do as Manasseh did, humble themselves and repent. That is to say that the retelling of this Manessa story in Chronicles is then an act of wisdom as we've been discussing it. It is reading the moment and then reading what has happened in the past and retelling or reimagining what God is doing and more important, what God will do in the future. It becomes a story of hope. Our closing idea, and I want to finish with a, a quote from near the end of the chapter, and, and I think this just really, really gets at it. These ancient writers simply could not leave the past in the past, but transposed it to the present. They did so not because the ancient stories in and of themselves held power, but because of what these ancient stories said about God. Israel told the stories over and over, and as we've been seeing throughout our course, often with shifts and changes in perspectives and uh, sort of updates this, what Dr. Enns calls this creative reimagining, imagining the God that they read about in the past at work in their present and in their hopes for the future. This is the, they, they tell these stories not for the benefit of themselves, but to talk about what God is like. It's a strong Jewish belief that you can't actually see God. You can't actually possess God. You can't actually completely understand God. If we could completely understand God in our human minds, then God would be limited to our minds, right? But we can tell stories. And that's really what the Bible is about, telling stories over and over different people, different places, different times, different needs, and their understanding of how God has shown up for them and how God has acted and will act in their lives. So I say amen to that. I love uh, thinking about these stories and always asking a question, what does this tell us about God? And what does this teach us about God's relationship, God's presence in our lives with the people of God? So next time we'll come back, we'll move ahead to chapter six, and we're going to be begin thinking about the question, what is God like? What is God like? One of my preacher friends says there's another question to go along with that, and I'll leave it with you for today, is that uh, we should also be willing to ask, what is God like? Putting those two words together and as one, what is God like? How should, how should we be acting like God? Thanks. I'll see you next time.